Welcome to the Momentum Matters podcast, where we have courageous conversations with women leaders. You'll hear about their accomplishments, experiences, challenges, and best advice. If you're inspired by women who have overcome barriers and gone on to do extraordinary things, you're in the right place. I'm April Benatello, CEO at Momentum Leaders, where we are on a mission to advance women in leadership. Now let's meet our guest. Hello, and welcome to the Momentum Matters podcast. I'm April Benatolo with Momentum, and I'm super excited to be here today with Josh Claypo, who is a clinical psychologist and has been doing work both as a professor at UAB and in their behavioral clinical. Josh, you're going to have to tell us all about your background. But you are now running your own coaching business, which I want us to delve into also, like where you made that switch and how that came about. Um, and you were recently one of the facilitators at our Momentum Leaders Conference for our Men with Momentum session, which was really exciting and we got great reviews on. So I want to dig into a lot of these topics about men and women at work and your mm -hmm. professional psychologist uh, take on where some of those differences lie. Um, and I was hoping we could just get started with you telling us a little bit about your background and, and what you do professionally. Absolutely. And um, it's great to be with you, April. And I guess it's a great honor to be the first male <laughs> in the series of the podcast, um, which is wonderful. So I have done a lot of things over the, for the trajectory of my career. Um, as you were saying, I was trained as a clinical psychologist. I am a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, I came to UAB uh, actually in 1996, where I joined the faculty in the Department of Psychology. I quickly moved over, though, to the School of Public Health. Um, and in that School of Public Health, I worked in the Department of Healthcare Organization and Policy. Um, my whole career, I've been fascinated by um, the interaction of human behavior and the products, services, systems that uh, we humans have to interact with and why those products, services, systems very often don't match up to what we know about human behavior. And I was particularly interested in healthcare because health is such an critical, um, not just industry, obviously it's the most important thing for us as individuals. And that's how I landed. Uh, in that department, spent 17 years at UAB in that department, uh, teaching and doing research. And then um, I got an opportunity to start my own company about five years before I left UAB. Uh, and that company was focused on using technology to help promote uh, people to engage in health behaviors. The way we used to talk about it, it was a, a rewards and loyalty technology. So it's your Amex or Visa needs. Instead of buying something, we ask you to do something, go have a physical or um, go exercise. The reason that that is important is it, it took me out of the academic setting and brought me face-to-face -face in business. Um, I was a vendor because I was trying to sell um, my product as part of this company. But I think one of the things about being a clinical psychologist, you can't unsee what you're trying to see. We work with very large employers. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times we'd be working with uh, individuals in the product department or marketing or human resources. And you could see that the challenges around employee engagement had so much to do with leadership interactions, how leaders were feeling and interacting with um, other individuals in the organization. I just, again, as a psychologist, you can't unsee that. And, and so while we ran our business and it was very successful, um, I spent a good six years really traversing the country, um, talking with uh, in, in individuals in, in human resources, in leadership, in product, in marketing, in customer service. And, you know, what was very clear in a real world sense was we struggle as individuals um, with how we communicate in the business setting. We know that we struggle with that in general, in relationships, et cetera. 
Um, and, and so I continued with that. Our business was acquired and then COVID hit. Um, and I've always been interested in organizational consulting and working with leaders. Um, and I've always done that on the side. COVID, I just ended up spending more time doing it. And because of the, the everybody being at home, started going from regional, local, to statewide and international. And it just kind of built on itself. And I always like to say, you know, I started this whole career as a clinical psychologist wanting to treat patients. And it only took about 25 years before I came around to being able to interact on the individual level. And so now what I do is I spend the majority of my time uh, in three buckets. Um, I do a lot of organizational consulting. So things around um, reorganization, change management, um, how do we grow companies? Um, how do we scale up? startups, those kinds of things, organizational consulting. I do a lot in performance coaching, so working with individuals in those organizations around everything from leadership to just professional development. And then there's sort of this third piece, which overlaps. I work with um, collegiate professional um, athletes as well, which is, I won't get into detail, but it's super interesting with um, NIL and these contracts and a lot of these college students are getting um, as they're in college we are now seeing athletes who are entrepreneurs by default um, long before they ever enter the business world and so it's so that's a maybe a little long but that is that is me and i will say one last thing the vast majority of my individual clients in large corporations are being um and this is, you know, frankly, this is what drew me to momentum was I didn't see enough men. And I work with a lot of female um, leaders who are in environments that are anywhere from not conducive to toxic. And as a male, um, I have a different perspective. And so my, some of my clients, like that, and I spent a lot of time doing. So, where do you see, like, when you compare your um, male clients and your female clients, where do you see the biggest difference in some of those challenges that they face? Because we always say, you know, oh, women they face unique challenges at work. We know what we see. What what is it that that you most often see? You know, it, it's interesting. It is there are without a doubt, um, generational differences, as well as industry differences. I think this is important because we are in a time, so I'm in my 50s, um, a lot of my clients who are um, have smaller startup companies, um, most of the leadership there are males, um, maybe 20% females, but they're in their 30s. Um, those leaders, male leaders, have a very different take on what it means to run a successful company from a culture standpoint. Um, that being different than your male leaders who are maybe in their 50s and 60s and maybe in larger organizations. So when I say smaller, I'm saying 50 to maybe a thousand. And when I say larger, I'm saying a thousand to 50,000 employees, just to give you some perspective. I think, I think there's, there's a couple of really unique differences. Number one, um, men don't know how to do communication. Well, sweeping, hello sweeping. But they struggle with it. They struggle with it because a lot of them weren't taught. Well, number one. Number two, frankly, they don't need to. And in order to still be successful from the corporate perspective, I see so many male leaders who find themselves in these very high levels of um, power in organizations. They don't know how to communicate. 
don't know how to talk. They're conflict avoidant. They're all these things that we shouldn't be, but most of them believe and are sort of cool that they know what they're doing. And so it's a really unique challenge because it's not just it's not just male leaders um, taking advantage of um, of power differential and gender differential. It's that coupled with they honestly believe this is how to do it. And so when you flip it and you say, okay, what's uniquely different now? The female leaders. Are, are receiving the brunt of that. And frankly, some of them have to, for survival purposes, kind of morph into this ineffective communication style. Um, and as a result, now you have male and female leaders not doing it well, or you have female leaders who have to make decisions about, um, frankly, how much can I take? How much of this inappropriate Inappropriate, but not always illegal. Inappropriate, but not always an HR issue. How much of this am I going to take and how am I going to navigate this environment? I hate to say it, but a lot of what I do with leaders is help them navigate unhealthy environments, which I would rather not be doing, but I, but I do end up. Yeah, that makes me think about um, a lot of times what we see is you know, women experience similar things at work as they do with their partners at home. So it's not necessarily the or the organization as much as it is right. at society. And you talk about that lack of um, of clear communication and how many women are going to say just the same of their boss as they say of their husband or their partner. I need affirmation. I need consistent affirmation. I need you to tell me when I am doing well. I need you um, to, to give me feedback, honest and clear feedback when I need to improve. And instead what they get is, well, you will know if I don't like what you're doing. Which, and this is, you and I have actually had this kind of conversation um, multiple times. That is wrong on every level. If it comes from a male, it's wrong. It's unhealthy. It um it creates inefficiency, misunderstanding, misinterpretation. If it comes from a female saying the same thing, it is no different. Right. It's a lot, I mean, a lot of what I'm doing when I'm working is saying what you all are doing, male, if I'm working with men. Um, is not only not appropriate from a human interaction standpoint and getting the most of what you want, but you're creating incredible opportunities for errors, incredible opportunities for psychological defenses to come up and to, for people not to tell you what you really want to hear or what you need to hear, for people to, I'm mean, going to take it further, people to lie, people to cheat, people to steal, all in the name of trying to navigate this kind of either uncertainty or, um, or lack of clarity around communication. It's, it is incredible able to see, besides the human toll of just what you described, you take that aside and say, we don't really care about that. We don't care how people feel. But in terms of the effectiveness of the organization, it completely takes away from the effect of the organization on two levels. One, your efficiency. You have people talking in circles because of that, because of defense mechanisms and fear. You have people um, not only talking in circles, but back channeling. You have individuals um, who are not executing on projects, tasks, and goals um, in subtle ways in order to avoid conflict. And so again, if you remove the, we care about people, you're running a business in this way now that is not as effective as it could be. And I, 
I'm in a position a lot of times of saying that. And there's a lot of leaders that do not like to hear that. Because what I'm telling them is if, if you know, okay, you don't like the touchy feely stuff, fine. You're creating an environment in which your people that you count on are not working optimal. And that's what you're asking them to do. So isn't that a great irony? And I see that all the time. And how do you recommend that people handle that when they are in a situation where they have um, superiors who are not clear communicators? What 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 can they do? Well, and that's I, that's a great question. You know, I think one of the things that when we work as coaches, um, we have to help our clients not only, I guess, learn best in class practices, but also learn how to navigate their environment. So you ask them, what do I say to them? You know, in a vacuum, I'd say, um, Brene Brown's language, which clears time. I say to their superior, hey, I'm trying to do the best that I can. The way that we're interacting is not working well for me. Um, if you could do X, Y, Z, I can do a better job. Seems simple enough. But there are many, many, many as you know, situations where that'd be the last thing I would recommend. Because that works in the textbook, but if we know that it's a toxic environment with a highly defensive ball, then that may not be the lead to go in there. And so a lot of what I'm teaching people, to be honest with you, is first learn how to read and, and understand the person that you're working with. You know, where are their defense might be? Where are the pressures coming from on them? Is it a lack of knowledge and information, as I was saying earlier? Have they never learned how to communicate? Or do they know how to communicate? And they're too afraid to you know, open up the proverbial can of... We used to see this with physicians all the time around mental health. Primary care physicians would never ask about mental health questions. Not so much because they didn't know what it was, they were scared to death that if they asked, how are you feeling? Are you sad? Are you blue? They wouldn't know how to manage the situation or more importantly, they wouldn't have the time. And so I encourage my clients, you know, yes, what you're receiving communication-wise is unhealthy, but think, I mean, I usually say, think like a psychologist. Why is that happening? And so, and this is where I think coaching is really important because there is a tendency sometimes to go, it must be me. Um, or there's a tendency to go, no, it's, it's not me at all, it's them. And what, the mind is, again, as a psychologist, probably a little bit of hope. Right. I'm curious, Josh, um, in the time that we have left, I'd love to hear your take on, um, we were talking earlier about generational differences, and we now have uh, women who are in top management, <clears throat> excuse me, positions, and they are leading teams, and a lot of those teams are now at least half, you know, comprised of men. What are you seeing in terms of trends and um, the challenges that men are facing in 2024? um in the workplace and what can what can we as female leaders do to to best help them be the best person that they can be and the most fulfilled they can be great question so while i i do see generate when i say generational differences let me clarify uh, just a little bit um May, the male leaders I work with, and I'm broad brushing, because, so there's, I mean, there's lots of variation, but the male leaders I work with who are in there, let's just say 30, the vast majority of them are not, you know, and, and these are hardcore entrepreneurs, startup, you know, but their mindset is about family, about balance, about culture of their organization, about making sure that their employees have the ability to, to navigate those things that are important to them. I hear I hear the, the term EQ all the time, right? Uh, it's basically emotional intelligence. I, everyone who's 30 knows about emotional intelligence. And so where the difference is, there is a absolute 
awareness of it and a you're not pulling anything out. That being said, to get back to your question, men still, just from a time standpoint, are not overall as a in communication and emotional insight. Um, it's getting better with programs like Men with Momentum, et cetera. But so what you have is if you have female leaders and men on their team, these men may be trying, but they still run into issues of they don't recognize their own shame or they're trying to, um, they don't know when they're being defensive. And so you'll have female leaders and you know not every female leader is perfect who may be engaging in certain behaviors and the males will respond in a way that, again, very often comes from a place of um, either lack of information, lack of education, and, and then on top of it, it's still a society that basically gives men a pass on it. I think the other thing that I would just say, and I say this with caution, even though it's going to be in the podcast, I also see some female leaders who, in order for them to have gotten where they're at, they've developed some pretty not so effective leadership and communication strategies because they've had to do that, frankly, to navigate it. And so now you have this strange sort of flip where it's kind of it's kind of dysfunctional on both sides, right? And then one feeds the other. Yeah, yeah that's that's exactly that's exactly. But I will say this. Well, and 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 you know this from your, your work with um my wife and and, and her business partner. Um if you get to people Julie to... and Lisa, Julie McDonald and Lisa Graham yes. with McDonald Graham, who are practically <laughs> an extension of our momentum team at this point. Uh, we use them. I so... wanted to make sure, yeah, yeah, I want to make sure you were plugging now. I wasn't plugging. But what do you see? And we see this over and over again. If people are willing to step in and say, I want to be a better person in the way that I work and run my company. And they say that honestly. And they say, I'm, I recognize that much like a sport or anything else, I'm going to have some weaknesses and it's going to be tough. If they'll step into that mindset or when they do, people like myself and Julie and Lisa and Momentum and others are able to help people exponentially grow and exponentially forget the growth, get better at what they do. And then that took us all the way back to what I was saying. It's not just you getting better and feeling better and you're more effective. Your organization, your division, wherever you are, will work better because this goes back to what I said when I joined the faculty. We have to better align the way we do business with what we know about human beings. And all that we've been talking about basically comes down. You know, no, well, okay. Here's what I want to get to. Um, I was observing some kids in my neighborhood play a couple of weeks ago. They're these boys, these boys who are probably five and six years old, and they are not related. Okay. So they are friends in the neighborhood. I have never seen girls play this way, right? They are rough and tumble tackling each other and rolling down the hill together and keeping the ball away from one another and challenging each other in every way. Right. And I, I just have, I have never seen girls play like that. So my question to you is, is how much of this stuff just comes hardwired in us? Do you think? Some of it does. But I love that you said that because I can give you two very quick examples. Obviously, again, as we've been saying, there's variation. There are a lot of young boys who that's very upsetting to. They don't like that. They go along with it because it's a cultural norm. But years later, they'll tell you, you know, I hated when they took the ball from me. Um, Brene Brown talked about the first time we all can remember the first time we were shamed. You know, so there's this sort of somewhat male, somewhat hardwired behavior. But within that, there's a lot of young boys who are just, if you will, going along with it. Um, 
some like it, some don't. You that know, that's means, a great point. My, my son shared with me when he was probably around in middle school, when he would was finally willing to articulate to me, I, I don't want to go to that kid's paintball party. And I said, I thought you liked paintball. And he goes, mom, it hurts when you get hit with the, the, the paintball thing. Uh, yes. I mean, and that's the thing. Again, we have acculturated men to, you know, Oh, boys, you never say that. Now, that's where things are changing. Absolutely, things are changing. It's okay as a boy now to say, or more okay, to say, I don't like to go to paintball because it hurts. I mean, the absurdity that that wasn't okay before is fits for itself. Right. But the other thing I would say is, and this is more of a hardwired thing, we know this from research, girls, women, um, particularly girls, and again, broad brushing, their um the way that they play is much more socially and psychologically and verbally driven and so what you get at a very early age are much more subtle jabs and stabs and teasing and um and group behavior and it's more nuanced and and the example that i give um quickly my daughter played played basketball the way through high school but when she was in about middle school they had a new coach and he was it he was he was male he was in his 20s he had his first child um it was a young girl he had only coached men's basketball and he was struggling because if you watch the girls the way that they treated each other there were subtle um looks subtle nonverbal behaviors you know, when we was kid, boys will just kill each other or go hit each other and that stuff. But the the complexity of the social dynamic, and he would look over going, What is happening? I mean, he had no clue. And and so I do believe that a lot of the differences can be hardwired, but they also then are fostered at a very early age. And so what we have to do. And, and you see this more and more is help kids understand that human behavior is healthy. Both some of that that's hardwired, some of that it's not. And that this is not, you know, and particularly with, with our uh, trans, transgender population, you know, this whole idea of what's okay and what's not okay, we have to be more, we have to be smarter about it. We used to talk about simpler days. I never bought that. Um, I feel like we were less insightful, less educated. We know things now that we can't just sort of rush away. And it all comes back to the same thing. If you want people to be effective, respect their humanity, which includes whatever gender identity they have. And if you can't do that, you'll, you'll have an impact as a leader but you will never have the kind of impact that you will have if you can do it by respecting their human. I love that because we are all on some kind of spectrum, whether that spectrum is a sexual orientation spectrum, whether it is a um, timid to aggressive alpha, you know, submissive, or uh, we're on some sort of a spectrum in terms of our intelligence, we're on some sort of a spectrum in terms of ev every aspect of our humanity. Our skin color is a spectrum, you know? And I, I love that we just have to sort of um, learn to quit putting people in, in the broad boxes and, and uh, respect the individuality of where they are as a human. Well, the, the common denominator, that I, I, every person I work with, even, even when I'm working with a, a women in a sort of toxic male environment is you have to accept that that is another human being. You can, the, the behavior can be abhorrent. You don't have to excuse it. But the second that we lose the concept that we are humans interacting with humans and, and our the fact that our humanness is equal, 
if you lose that for a second, you now no longer can effectively interact with somebody else. Now, all of us have done it. We do it with our kids. We do it with our significant others. We do it with power situations. We do it with people who are angry. It's okay to flip, but you have to come back to that fundamental understanding that this is another human being. And if you look at them in any other way, you no longer will be able to interact with them in an optimal way. That's the ground rule for how we should be doing. I love it. I love it. And I swear I could talk to you all day long on these topics. Um, Josh, I have read some of your work. Uh, you are published in Forbes online and um, have a lot of resources on your website. Would you mind sharing with our audience, people who want to find out more about the performance mindset that you uh, work on and um, just read more about your work? I appreciate it. But yes, um, you can go to my webpage. The webpage is uh, mentaldrive.com mental drive one word.com social media it's all the same so instagram facebook tiktok x it's all um at mental drive one word uh okay. and everything points back like everything points back to everything else um plus my last name is somewhat unique and so if you google anything close um i'm pretty i'm i'm quite out there um on social media and in sort of the public um perspective that being said one qualifier and i tell all my clients this um the work that i do in media and social media for me as someone who works in the school of public health that is public health service to me it is very important to me but it is never compromised with the confidentiality of my clients because as a clinical psychologist it is the most important thing that we have and so i always have to tell my clients my organization you may see me a lot of places, but if we're working together, that confidentiality. Sure. People have work. It's like what we say, what is said at momentum stays at momentum. And that is 100%. Yes. Exactly. Josh, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope it won't be the last time. I'm happy to come back April anytime you Perfect. And we are going to be linking to um, some of the resources I mentioned in our show notes so people can look for them there. So thank you so much, Josh. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, April. Thank you for listening to our show today. We invite you to subscribe to Momentum Matters so you never miss an episode. And we'd be so grateful if you would leave us a rating and a review to help others learn about our show. Momentum Matters is produced in partnership with Social You. Many thanks to our sponsor companies, including America's Thrift Stores, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, Protective Life, and Regents Bank. A full list of Momentum sponsors is online at MomentumLeaders.org slash sponsors. Beyond this podcast, we have a lot of ways to get more momentum in your life. Check out the show notes for links and resources. That's all for this episode. See you next time on Momentum Matters.